They're all yours. Ah, oh, you're all mine. Be gentle. That's it. Be gentle. You didn't say that. That's it. This is not a gentle presentation. Are you all sitting uncomfortably? Then I will begin. Now, my name is Matthew Griffin. I'm the CEO and founder of the 311 Institute. I look at over 600 emerging technologies with a 50-year timeline, and I run three national security programs where we actually have a look at the future of cyber and emerging technology, and where our teams ostensibly just try to figure out how to destroy everything, and then how to ratchet it back and actually develop a variety of different solutions. Uh, now, in this particular presentation, just bearing in mind that I am vying for your attention along with the people who are actively trying to hack all of your companies as you sit here, let's face it, as well as the spam messages that are coming into your inboxes and everything else. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be having a look at this. We're going to be having a look at some future foundations, the future of artificial intelligence that you probably haven't thought about or seen with a guest appearance. We're going to be talking about the emerging threatscape, but we're going to keep it gentle. Okay? Don't want to freak you out too much. Then we're going to talk about crimonomics. Then we're going to be talking about opportunities. So, when we actually have a look at the world around us, fortunately, there is only one thing that's changing. You look around you, there's just one thing that's changing. It's just a bit unfortunate that it happens to be everything, right? Society, technology, economics, environment, politics, we won't even go there. So when we actually have a look at the future, basically that we're trying to actually understand what it means for us, there are hundreds of trends, and these are some of them. This is what we're trying to get our heads around. If these trends combine, which they do, then what's the impact of all of this on my individual business, industry, my life, my livelihood, my family and relationships, the world. And when you start combining all of this stuff together, the kind of futures that we can actually map out are fortunately infinite, which just means I have to spend a lot of time trying to figure out everything. But increasingly, I have an AI that does it all for me while I'm on a beach, right? Climate change it was up there for like quarter of a second. AI is up there for like quarter of a second. And it's not just you, your customers and clients are trying to figure out what does all of this mean for us and our vision, our strategy, our technology stack, our partnerships and so on and so forth. Now increasingly we kind of live in this VUCA Max world. We're all familiar with VUCA or VUCA as Patrick might say from being from America. VUCA was the term coined by the US military in the 1970s, but increasingly we're using this MAX acronym because increasingly the changes that we see are massive. They are system level, global. Doesn't matter whether it's politics, environment, economics, they're global. Increasingly they're accelerating, and then in addition to that, they're exponential. Now, when we think about exponential, we all too often think about exponential technologies. That's kind of where our head actually goes first. However, we are also increasingly changing the world at exponential speed. So in June 2019, Facebook released their cryptocurrency called Libra, or they tried to. And the regulators at the time said no. However, if Facebook had been able to release their cryptocurrency, they could have had, if they'd executed perfectly, two billion people using it by the end of the day, which, in the chairman of the People's Bank of China, the US Federal Reserve, the ECB, and the Bank of England, said it could have changed the world's control of money overnight and the global financial services system overnight because Libra was a basket of fiat, crypto, of fiat currencies, among other things. So that's the speed of digital. We can create something today, and if we can execute perfectly, two billion, four billion people by the end of the day could be using it or listening to our opinions about cats. But we're accelerating. 
we're increasingly moving at the speed of artificial intelligence. And it's partly because of this. So if you step back about five years ago and you wanted to create a physical product that changed an industry or a digital product that changed an industry, you'd have had to have hired large teams, you'd have to have a good level of resources and expertise, you'd have had to have had money. But on the top left here, that is a rocket engine that was designed by artificial intelligence in six hours by a company called Hyperganic in Germany. Google DeepMind, along with other biotech organizations, we can develop vaccines because we have done it, not because we're talking theory, in seven minutes. We have artificial intelligence being used by NVIDIA and Google and others to create artificial intelligence accelerator chips. And then, of course, we have AI writing code. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. If you're getting on a plane tonight, parts of that plane, like an Airbus A320, would have been designed by, not with, an artificial intelligence. So we can create products and get those products to market much, much faster. So everything is accelerating. Now, from a technology perspective, I think the vast majority of the people that I meet around the world, we're kind of back in this scenario, right? Cavemen and women sitting in front of this shiny object. And we aren't really sure what this shiny technology object is. Do we bash it against a rock? Or do we take over the universe with it? Now, when we have a look at things from a technology perspective, artificial intelligence is just one thing on this starburst. This starburst tracks 180 emerging technologies up to 50 years out. So horizon one, two, three, and generation plus five. Now, what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to go through it. But when we actually have a look at what we're developing in the labs to try to defend ourselves, basically from the latest cybersecurity threats, as well as physical threats, we have the security piece here. So on the one hand, we are trying to develop artificial intelligence immune systems. We've already seen some of these deployed into the internet. And some of them have already demonstrated, kind of like polymorphic malware, that they're relatively autonomous. We have constitutional artificial intelligence because I have eight-year-olds breaking the guidelines and the guardrails for $90 billion AIs back at home. We have hack-proof code. So this is where we use artificial intelligence and maths to verify the codes and that they haven't changed. We've got the Morpheus computing platform. The Morpheus computing platform is from the University of Michigan. We had 300 of the world's top hackers, gave them direct access to this computer chip that changes what it does, how it does, 50 times a second. And after three months, they couldn't hack it. We've got one-time programs. So as we see quantum computers coming through, we have the theoretical OTPs now actually starting to come through quantum safe blockchains, we've got lattice encryption for post-quantum encryption if we need that, and so on and so forth. And then we've also got zero knowledge proof cryptography, which is increasingly vital in our arsenal as we try to battle the people that are trying to tear us down. And you combine all these different technologies and you get next generation products and services. And every industry is being transformed. Every industry is converging. As we digitize industries, all of a sudden, an ag tech industry can move into insurance and logistics and mobility. So that makes it more complex, basically, to defend our enterprises. When we have a look at construction, we are 3D printing skyscrapers in Dubai. When we have a look at the energy transition, it's a $92 trillion transition. We are literally trying to rewire the world. When we have a look at finance, we have Bank 4.0, we have automated and autonomous banks coming through, we have fintechs, and then we have decentralized finance coming through as well. And then in healthcare, 
the breakthroughs in healthcare are truly science fiction-like. We can edit your genome basically while you're in a hospital bed to take away your inherited genetic disease. We can 3D print hearts, kidneys, bones, and other tissue. So the world that you actually think you live in is generally not the world that you actually live in. Now, all of you in this room are increasingly using and embedding artificial intelligence in your business. Traditionally, when we talked about AI in a business, it would be machine learning or robotic process automation. Dumb stuff. Things that are designed, if this happens, do this pre-programmed. However, as the AIs that you are embedding into your organizations and the same with your clients become increasingly sophisticated and smart, on the one hand, these AIs can now take information in and decide to do something. So are you going through a digital transformation? Or as you start building a brain within your company, are you actually undergoing an intelligence transformation. Now, when we talk about moving at speed, one of the big problems that you have is I can have a 10-year-old create a set of ransomware, and they can be after you in five minutes. As an organization, as I create new ways to attack you, to tear you down, I act at speed. As a business, you're slow. Now, on the one hand, that's processes, bureaucracy, that's levels of management, it's all those kinds of good things. But we know that artificial intelligence can write code. So when we have a look at adaptive organizations, no one's doing this yet. We see a point in time where your AI brain within your business can see something happening outside of the business, a new market, a new threat, whatever. And then it simply recodes your RPA your processes, the other artificial intelligences and the software in your business to adapt in real time. So increasingly, we see the technologies coming through that increasingly let your business become essentially a living entity that can identify new things and recode itself in real time. Now, when we have a look at the future of AI, do you really know what you are actually using when we say AI, ChatGPT, this is fact. ChatGPT that you use and your kids use has a verbal IQ of 155, putting it in the top 1% of humans. It has a 1,000 times more general knowledge than any of us, which is why I can say to it, if I can crack its guardrails, and I can do it in another way, but theoretically. I can get ChatGPT to tell me how to make a bomb, how to make malware, how to do ransomware, how to attack you. It knows how to do that because it's been taught. But I can also get it to tell me how to bake a cake. So you have access to an AI that has been trained on everything on the internet, all the research papers, the whole lot. And it learns 300 million times faster, which means, in the words of Jeffrey Hinton, who is the godfather of artificial intelligence, this is a fundamentally superior learning algorithm to the human brain. That's what you're tapping into. That's what criminals are tapping into increasingly, because ChatGPT has guardrails. But when I train LLMs on the dark web, like FraudBert and DarkBert, who has no constitution. I can do whatever I like with them. And AI is already exceeding all human benchmarks. In fact, it's already breaking all of our tests, so much so that organizations like Meta, Google, and so on and so forth say that we need new tests to test the capabilities of AI. The next generations of artificial intelligence basically will be in interactive, large action models. These are kind of agent-based. Zero-shot learning. So increasingly, with Google DeepMind, we are creating artificial intelligences that kind of just know how to do stuff. They're intuitive, like biological organisms. You know, when a baby giraffe is born, do you see its mother saying, this is how you walk? We are embedding artificial intelligence with innate capabilities. 
which take us into an entirely different space. Now, the next generation, when we have a look sort of GPT-4, GPT-5, we see agents, okay? Now, consider this. When we have a look at artificial intelligence agents, they are able to work together to do something. However, a lot of the agents that we've seen at the moment actually start communicating with one another in their own made-up languages. So when it comes to trying to figure out how these agents are actually working together to do something for you, like defend your business or run your business, increasingly, we don't know what they're doing, how they're doing it, and we have no way to monitor them. In addition to that, though, a little while ago, we used just pure agents. So agents are like bots, but smart, to build a company. They built a software company. In fact, they actually built 70 new companies. And it took them seven minutes and cost a dollar. So AI is already building businesses. Now, I've been talking about this really for about the past 10 years. But you might recognize this chap. He's the chap from, actually, I meant, no, hang on. Sam Altman. Okay, This is Sam Altman. And what Sam Altman describes is the use of artificial intelligent agents to get an AI to build a multi-billion dollar company. But if you have agents building a company, and there is a transition time. You know, the first people to use AI to build companies, we've already done that. However, over time, basically, we will see this trend, especially, basically, in entrepreneurs. As your businesses that you're selling to, basically, actually start using these technologies, the threat surface is gigantic. And there aren't any ways that we can defend against it at the moment. However, when we have a look at 2028, again, with organizations like open AI, and so on and so forth, the point at which we reach artificial general intelligence, where AGI is defined as the point in time where AI exceeds and outperforms all humans in all economically valuable work, then we estimate we will have an AI with an IQ of 1,600, 1 billion times more general knowledge than any human, and an unknown learning speed. Now. There are two sides to this coin. As individuals, we will be able to use these kinds of artificial intelligences to solve the world's problems. As criminals, I will be able to figure out how to take you down faster. And we aren't prepared for this. Now, when we have a look at the emerging threatscape, quite frankly, the cost of attacking you, whether it's you, your clients, your family, whatever it happens to be, from a digital perspective, is dropping to zero. It's increasingly low cost for me to create something new, an exploit. It's increasingly low risk because it's increasingly hard to do attribution. I can create malware that looks like it was created by the North Korean APT-28. And then you go and blame them when it's me in London. 
And it's also high reward. Yeah. So increasingly what we have is when we have a look at the open source and large language models that have been trained on really the dark web, I'm an idiot, but I can use those to make new cyber weapons. I have eight-year-olds, basically, that are creating malware. They were never trained in Python. We also see these threats emerging, so agentic workflow attacks. So this is where you have agents within your business, but also outside of your business, that are responsible to do, for doing things in a chain. And we attack either the agents or the chain. When we have a look at robo-hackers, for about the past eight years, I've been talking about the point in time where we will see fully autonomous cyber systems that will be able to take companies down. Yesterday, I saw the first example of this actually in a lab. So we used fully autonomous GPT agents to attack zero-day vulnerabilities, and they had a 53% success rate. So when we talk about the future of cyber, we talk about autonomous cyber system of systems. However, for those of you that actually have used a large language model within your company, you can't protect against what I'm doing because we've managed to psych out AIs. AIs, ironically, that have been trained on human language can be corrupted using human language. And we've got them to do insider trading, create malware, obviously. We've got them to make bombs, or at least tell us how. So increasingly, I can hack and tweak the behaviors or even destroy your artificial intelligences using human psychology. That's a weird one. Deep fake hires. As organizations in the technology industry manage service partners, increasingly we're seeing the use of deep fakes when you're trying to hire remote workers. I saw this at the FAA basically a little while ago. And when you actually have a look at this, you know, the person that you are interviewing, it's a deep fake. You give them a job, and then when you give them a job in your remote IT support division, you say, here's your credentials and your login. Have fun in our system. And then we see laptop farms, basically even from North Korea, accessing quite a number of American companies right now. So, and then deep fakes, just in general, are a whole thing. I mean, we've seen over $200 million drained from different company coffers like Arup using deep fakes. But when we actually have a look at trying to break all of the world's encryption, we can break 256 AES encryption with a 10,000 qubit accurate quantum computer circa 2028-2030. So a lot of organizations at the moment are moving to new encryption standards. However, a year ago, we saw the Chinese researchers, not necessarily military, we saw Chinese researchers cloning the seeds of lasers to create cloned photonic streams, which is a way to start undermining quantum communications. In addition to that, we also created new algorithms that are much, much better. So quantum algorithms that are much, much better at cracking algorithms and encryption. And we actually brought that date forward from about 2030, 2028 to about 2027 using AI and quantum. So just because people tell you we can crap, crack encryption circa 28, 2030, don't bet on it. Now, from a crimeonomics perspective, we often talk about it's a cat, game of cat and mouse, right? But have you really thought, basically, that on the one hand, the mouse that you are chasing is affecting $7 trillion of the global economy? You're chasing a gigantic mouse. So get that picture of the little mouse out of your head. It's gigantic. So last year, we estimate that serious organized crime groups took about $1.2 trillion in revenue from cybercrime. That's up from about $600 billion in 2018. And it's only going that way. 125% growth, basically, in cyber attacks. We saw just under half a billion ransomware attacks. 
although the reason we're not seeing too many ransomware attacks at the moment is because insurance companies don't pay out in a time of war. We saw five and a half billion malware attacks. And increasingly, insurance companies are saying, we're not insuring you from a cyber perspective. Or they're writing in huge amounts of legalese text in the small text. From a company perspective, the cost of defending your businesses is only going to go one way. So you either need to use tech, tech as a multiplier, or you need to do something new. So using JP Morgan as a rather extreme example to prove the point, year on year, JP Morgan sees a twofold, at least a twofold increase in the number of attacks basically against the organization. Each day, they see 45 billion attempts. That's the whole pot. They spend $12 billion a year trying to defend the bank. They have 65,000 people. Now, at what point, as they see the number of in attacks increase, because AI is either helping criminals or it's automating or going autonomous, at what point does next year JP Morgan spend 24 billion with 130,000 people? They can't keep it up. Which means this. I have not spoken to a single government or national security agency that does not think decentralized cyber defense works any longer. While I am standing here, my websites and everything else are undergoing about 3,000 brute force attacks, an increase of about 200% in the past few months. It's only going one way. And yet, as a business, I'm expected to defend myself. Here's my CISO, here are my security analysts and teams, as my SecOps center, fantastic. It's a sunk cost. And this is where your opportunity is, because decentralized cyber defense doesn't work. You need to centralize it. This is why we see increasingly all massive tech companies centralizing cyber. So this is the opportunity. On the one hand, you have to collaborate. As you look around the room, it's very easy for you to look at one another and see each other as a competitor. In most service spaces, you are competing with one another for different pots of the customer pie. But when it comes to cyber and security, it's everyone's problem. You should be looking around this room and not seeing competitors in the cyberspace, but seeing comrades and collaborators. You are the best team that you could put together, but it requires all of you, because increasingly we cannot do it alone. When we have a look at information sharing, this comes from the aviation sector. Acting as a single unit, if you start seeing different threats emerge, you should be able to share that with your other MSPs. Because you all become stronger when you start sharing vital intelligence on who's being attacked, how, using what. Secure by design. With CISA in the United States, we've now seen 68 software manufacturers sign up for secure by design, getting rid of default passwords, multi-factor authentication, you know, that kind of stuff. You have to use technology as a multiplier. If you do not use technology as a multiplier, your sunk cost of defending yourselves and your customers will only keep doing this. And at some point, the CFO says, no. Right? We all love, love the CFOs on the CISO conversation. And then zero trust. But this isn't zero trust as you kind of think, you know, cyber zero trust. This is zero trust in everything. Because we are taking companies down using deep fakes, fake information, whatever it happens to be. This is zero trust in everything. People, artificial intelligences, workloads, information. Complete zero trust. Do this, and you'll be well protected. And then in the investment space, basically we estimate that by 2026, the cyber opportunity in terms of revenue is a $2 trillion opportunity. I work with plenty of investors around the world. How many of you think that next year, cyber is going to be less of a problem 
put your hands up. Next year, cyber will be less of a problem. Exactly, we even have laughing, right? So it's an opportunity. And we have solutions. Now, on the one hand, we've been using generative artificial intelligence to improve the productivity of our SecOps teams by twofold. So we're doing double the amount with the same number of people and resources. Because while criminals have access to all of these incredibly powerful tools, so do you. You just act slower than the criminal, and you need to close the speed gap. That's your main problem. That's bureaucracy, hierarchies, processes, and everything else. In addition to that, we're moving basically from reactive defense. You are all waiting to be attacked. You're all trying to find out if you have already been attacked, right? So with organizations like Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, companies like Forta, we're trying to move basically to predictive attacks. So this is where we use artificial intelligence, combine it with typically dark web data, and we see activity in this part of the dark web, and it says, we're looking for some SQL injection technologies or exploits, basically for Walmart, and you then go to Walmart and say, we think that this group will use this kind of attack on you probably here. Now, when we actually have a look at blockchain, Fortibus, he actually went to Eula Hermes and said, based on our predictive intelligence, we think that you are going to lose $250 million from your blockchain protocol. Two minutes later, Eula Hermes lost $250 million from their blockchain protocol. Now, on the one hand, they got it back, but two things are interesting. On the one hand, they were warned something was going to happen. We have the tech. Time series AI helps us with that. But they could not have reacted fast enough. They couldn't have unplugged the servers and the systems fast enough to prevent it. So there is the speed of detection and there is the speed of response that's also important. We're also fighting back. How many of you love lawyers? Oh, come on. Give the lawyers some love. OK. Well, if you're not in love with lawyers, unless you're married to one, hopefully, then, frankly, how would you identify and take out a completely anonymous scammer? Okay. Now, if your answer in your head is, I have no idea how to do that, then thank the lawyers. So a little while ago, basically, we saw a crypto scammer drain $2.1 million worth of Bitcoin from an account. You know, he scammed a little old lady and she transferred her $2.1 million Bitcoin life savings to the scammer. Now, using an airdropped NFT, which was airdropped to the scammer's wallet, crypto wallet, we had a cease and desist and put an injunction on the crypto scammer's Bitcoin wallet on a decentralized exchange. So that meant basically that the scammer, we didn't know who it was, but that meant that the scammer could not move the $2.1 million worth of crypto anywhere else. So guess what? Gave it all back. So increasingly, we actually have ways to make people who don't want to be found give us stuff back. And that's before we look at how we actually crack ransomware encryption and everything else. We can now crack encryption on about 124 different kinds of ransomware. And we can do it for free. So we're fighting back. But as a closeout, this is where you have opportunities, new revenue streams, new markets. Artificial intelligence audits. Because no one really knows how the black box works. No one knows what the security implications or even the legal implications are of using many of these AIs. Pen testing, certification and training, client wargaming. How many of you bring your clients in to do a wargaming practice? So increasingly, we talk about how resilient your clients are, how much of your organization can still run in an attack. Because if you say 95% of my organization can still run when we're being attacked, that's fine. But traditionally, it's been 80%. So resilience and client wargaming. Insurance services. Insurers are quite literally bailing on the cyber scene. 
because the fines and the class action lawsuits are astronomical. 23andMe could be put out of business because they're being sued for a breach. MDR services, risk assessments, there's risk everywhere. And then in terms of what you do tomorrow, you pick sort of one of those areas and you put a small goal in at the business and you say next year, we want two to 3% of our revenues to come from something that we don't do today. And next year it's two to 3%. The year after it's six or seven. The year after it's 10 or 15, whatever. But by making small changes today, you can not only increase the revenue opportunity for your businesses, you can actually help protect your clients in ways that they haven't even thought of yet. So unlearn, experiment, explore and expand your mind. And I hope this little session by has done some of that for you. And thank you very much for your time. <laughs>